Once the two hypotheses of the mean value theorem are satisfied, we are able to find a number C that satisfies the conclusion. And the conclusion of the mean value theorem is stated right here. If we look at that conclusion carefully, we need several bits of information. We can begin with the value of A, and that is very simply the left endpoint of the given interval. So we can simply say that A is going to equal zero. B is the right endpoint of the given interval. So in this case, B is going to equal four. Now, in addition to A and B, we're going to need to calculate the values of F of A as well as F of B. For F of A, it's very simple. All you're going to do is take your value of A, which is zero, plug it into the function. So in this case, we're just going to have the square root of zero. And that, of course, is equal to zero. And then for F of B, we're going to plug the B value, so four, into the function. And we're going to end up with the square root of four, which is equal to two. So far, so good. But perhaps the most challenging thing to find is F prime of C. Now, we don't have F prime yet. We only have F or F of X. So basically, what we're going to need to do next is take our function and compute the derivative of our function. So we'll scoot down here and we will rewrite the function. So we have f of x is equal to the square root of x. And when taking the derivative of this particular function, it's going to be useful to rewrite the square root in terms of an exponent. Now, with the square root, we have an implied 2 for the index of the root. And then we have a power of 1. So we're going to rewrite this in exponential notation as x to the power of 1 over 2. And once we have that, we can easily calculate the derivative using a power rule. So we're going to say f prime of x equals, and then the power rule tells us to kind of drag the power down in front. So we'll have 1 half multiplied by x, and then we have to subtract 1 from the original exponent. 1 half minus 1, of course, is negative 1 half. Now that's great, but we don't quite want f prime of x. We want f prime of c. So what we can do next is plug c into this derivative. So we would have f prime of c is equal to 1 half multiplied by c to the power of negative 1 half. And that's pretty good, but still we want to modify this. It's usually easier to take a negative exponent and rewrite it in terms of a positive exponent. So just a reminder about how that works. If you have c to the power of negative 1 half, you can rewrite that as 1 over c to the positive 1 half. So rewriting our f prime of c in this manner would give us 1 half multiplied by 1 over c to the power of 1 half. Now we're going to multiply these two fractions. And when we do that, we multiply the numerators and also multiply the denominators. So the final form of our f prime of c will be in the numerator 1 times 1 and in the denominator 2 times c to the half. So this is great, and now that we have this component, we can go back to the conclusion of the mean value theorem and plug everything in. So let's take a look at that. So right here is the conclusion of the mean value theorem, and then we have listed all of the components on the side. We're going to start plugging in. So f prime of c, as noted, was 1 over 2c to the power of 1 half. And this will equal our f of b, which was 2 minus our f of a, which was 0. And then this is all divided by b, which was 4, minus a, which was 0. Now on the right hand side, we can simplify. We have 2 over 4. But of course, that reduces to just 1 over 2. And then perhaps what we can do next is cross multiplication. So we'll just circle the components accordingly. When we cross multiply, we're going to have 2c to the half times 1. So that's just 2c to the half. And then we equate that to 2 times 1, which of course is 2. We are getting there. If we divide both sides of this equation by 2, we're going to get 1 on the right-hand side. So c to the power of 1 half is equal to 1. Let us not forget that c to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of c. And then to rid ourselves of the square root, we can kind of square both sides of this equation. And this gives us c is equal to 1. So this would be the correct answer for the value of c. There was another aspect to the question. If we go back and take a look, it says to graph the function, the secant line through the endpoints, and the tangent line, c comma f of c. 
and then we're asked if the secant line and tangent line are parallel. So that's a bit of a mouthful. Let's go ahead and graph the function on the interval from 0 to 4. And to do that, we can simply plug 0 back into our function. Remember, when we did that, we got 0. So there's a point 0, comma 0 on our graph. And then f of 4, the right end point, was equal to 2. So we have a point 4, comma 2. So we'll graph that point. And probably most of us remember that a square root function has a bit of curvature to it. So this would be the graph right here. Now the secant line through the endpoints is simply a line that joins those two endpoints together. So we would just draw a line connecting our left and right endpoints, and that would be our so-called secant line. Now recall that we had found the key value of c to equal 1. And if we plug 1 into our function, so we'll take f of 1, we would have the square root of 1. Of course, the square root of 1 is just 1. So what this means is that at the point 1, 1, we can plot a value there. So perhaps roughly about right there. This drawing is not perfectly to scale. But there is the point 1, 1. That is what the question, by the way, was calling c, f of c. That was just their way of annotating the point 1, 1. And if we draw the tangent line through that point, we would indeed see that that tangent line is parallel to the secant line. The reason they're parallel is because they have the same slope. And so this would be a sort of illustrated version of the mean value theorem. We have confirmed that the tangent line and secant line are indeed parallel.